Now, this is about Iraq uh, five years on, but also about what happened in Iraq five years ago. Remember where you were uh, during shock and awe, Harlan Ullman's phrase for the uh, Office of the Secretary of Defense uh, that night. Uh, I have to tell you that I was in a five-star hotel in Qatar, and I want no sympathy. I could show you the pictures, but um, uh, it was not hardship, so I don't want you to think that I was involved in any way in, uh, in schlecking it through the desert. Uh, I was stuck on a roof. Uh, trying to um, uh, summarize what was happening because of contact problems with those who were embedded. But I'm not important. John Burns and Alistair MacDonald are the important guests tonight. And uh, we're going to see a bit of video in a moment. But first of all, John and Alistair, tell us what you've been doing for the last five years. Don't give us your whole CV, but what <coughs> were you doing five years ago? So we can just put this into context. And what have you done since related to Iraq? You have one minute. John. I was on the hotel roof, like you. Where? In Baghdad, the pastime hotel. We'd broken our way through up the fire staircase onto the roof, uh, and we had grandstand seats for the, uh, for the bombing. We knew when it was going to begin because the BBC had told us that B-52s had taken off from Fairford at about 2.15, as I recall, and it was difficult to calculate the flying time and the standoff time for firing cruise missiles, and at exactly 9 o'clock, the show began. Had you been embedded? No. No. How, I, how had I, you got there? I, was, I had been in Baghdad for the last nine months under Saddam, and uh, we, we took the risk. It was a risk. I'm not much of one for the journalist's hero, but probably the biggest risk was deciding to stay on once it became obvious that the war uh, was unstoppable. Because up until that time, if you worked for the New York Times or Reuters or the BBC, you wore a suit of armor. You knew that it was very unlikely they were going to bang you on the head um, and thus speed the course to war. But once war became unstoppable, all bets were off, and, right. and so we stayed. One more minute on what have you done until you left Baghdad in February of last year? Well, the New York Times, uh, after the uh, city fell to the Americans, set up a bureau, of course, beca has become the biggest and most expensive bureau, overseas bureau we've ever had, something probably that the BBC and, uh, and uh, Reuters could also say. And I stayed on. Uh, altogether five years. I left last autumn and came to London uh, to be the bureau chief here where I have the altogether more difficult job of deciding what is a story and what is not. In Baghdad, that's not something you usually have to do. All right, Alistair MacDonald, uh, you were bureau chief uh, in Baghdad. Where were you five years ago and what have you done since you're now bureau chief for Israel and the Palestinian territories for Reuters? Five years ago I was uh, also somewhat hotel bound, uh, although I think at that time I was uh, probably in the Reuters bureau in Dubai where we were desking, it was our sort of HQ, our Qatar if you like, um, and on the phone to my colleagues who were in Baghdad and variously embedded around the, the border in Kuwait and, and up in the north. I think uh, I was probably on the phone at uh, that evening with uh, Samia who's there at the back and uh, Nadim who were manning our bureau in Baghdad. And how long were you uh, bureau chief in Baghdad? So uh, I was in and out of Iraq after the war and uh, from the middle of 2005 I was bureau chief in Baghdad for a couple of years. I came out uh, last, uh, last spring, and I've been in Jerusalem since then. Has anyone got a burning question at the moment? Because I'd like to find out as well how many of you were involved in Iraq one way or the other, so we can work out how to calibrate. How many were you involved in the military operation or in Baghdad or Basra or wherever who have had experience? Just give us an idea, please. This isn't a, a poll or anything. Maybe 20%. Yeah. <laughs> you don't describe the five-star restaurant, though, will you? Good. Thank you. Uh, I know it's on the record, but it's on the record as well. Um, okay. Well, about 20, 30 percent of you. Um, has anyone got a burning question that you'd like raised tonight in the next hour and 15 minutes? Because often that helps focus the debate. I've got plenty of things I'm going to talk about with, uh, with Alistair and John. Please, yeah. Just a microphone. <clears throat> well, it's Aaron Patrick from the Wall Street Journal. I've got a question about what's happening in Baghdad, we, we often read about the sectarian killings that people are, are tortured before they're killed. And I don't understand why, if you're going to kill someone, you need to torture them first, and whether this is happening a lot or if it's just some isolated cases. Right. Let's talk about that in a moment. About journalism particularly and the challenges of the last five years, particularly as the technology has changed. Anything about, uh, okay, well, think about it, because I think what we'll do, Marina, is run the uh, four and a half minute video. Do you just want to give us a little bit of background, Alistair, of this video? Because it's actually taken from a much longer video. Uh, I'm not actually entirely sure what we're going to see, but this is uh, put together as something that we've uh, put out on the uh, Reuters website. Uh, I think last night and today will be out there for the uh, 
for the duration across the anniversary. So we're looking at um, specifically how we have experienced the reporting of the war and uh, there is a, a number of resources there looking at the five years, what's been happening, some of our pictures on display, our video archive, and talking to uh, some of the people who worked there for Reuters and their experiences, ways that, that it's marked them, and how we feel that our job has been either accomplished or been difficult to do. And particularly those who are Iraqis who've been working for you. Yes, I mean, you'll see uh, many of our Iraqi staff not very willing to be clearly identified in public, and we do have an interview up there with uh, particularly one of our best-known uh, photographers who did not want his face to appear on camera. All right, well, let's have a look at it, Marina, can we? Iraq has been the most dangerous war in, in history for journalists, but I think it shows the value of what we're doing. <laughs> places is a worthwhile thing. It can bring about change, it can inform the world, and it is worth us risking our lives. We rely pretty much everywhere in the world in Reuters uh, on local correspondents who know the story well, who can get on the inside, and they work closely with foreigners who can bring uh, these kind of outside experience. مرت بصراحة متعب إنه الخطورة الحقيقية اللي أنا يعني اللي تمر بيها الخطورة ما أقدر أقولها منيح يعني ثاني يوم بعد تقول لي بطلت Stories 
going on, no one is going to forget this story. Again, let's put this into perspective. Mm -hmm. 280 media workers uh, uh, lost uh, in Iraq in the last five years. The predicaments, uh, first of all, that Reuters have faced, Alistair, again, put this into perspective. How many have you lost? Who were they? Mm -hmm. And how many are you still um, having problems with? Well, we lost seven people uh, since, uh, since the invasion in Iraq. Um, of those, uh, somewhat unusually, uh, seven, uh, six of those have been killed by uh, uh, American forces, uh, and a seventh was killed in what appears to have been a sectarian attack, uh, not necessarily uh, aimed at him, uh, his work uh, uh, for the media. Um, clearly, there are a number of factors. We've found ourselves as the media in Iraq caught in the middle of a war in a way that I don't think we've ever been caught before. Uh, where on the one hand you had people who particularly disliked you because you were a foreigner and or particularly disliked you because you were working as a journalist. Uh, and those people have attacked journalists since the beginning. Uh, and we also had a very dangerous environment simply for being out on the streets. And we felt that we had also uh, a particular issue with the military, particularly the American military, and a failure to understand the role of independent journalists out there in a country that, although involved in a conflict, was still a country that we wanted to report on. Uh, and so, uh, just running through it very quickly, we lost uh, Taras Pratyuk, uh, who was a cameraman working in the Palestine Hotel. Uh, we had three other colleagues uh, wounded, and another cameraman for a television, uh, Spanish television company was, uh, was also killed uh, when an American tank fired at the Palestine Hotel uh, on the day that the Americans entered Baghdad in 2003. Uh, we lost Mazen Dana, a Palestinian cameraman who was shot by an American soldier outside Abu Ghraib prison in the summer of 2003. Uh, in 2004, we lost uh, Dian Najim, who was an Iraqi uh, cameraman working for us in Ramadi. Uh, the American said he was killed in, a, in crossfire. Uh, his, uh, his relations, his friends, and the evidence that we could retrieve from his film suggested that he'd been shot by a sniper, probably an American, but we probably never know. Uh, Wadi Khalid, who was a, uh, a driver for one of our cameramen in Baghdad, was uh, shot dead by an American uh, unit in September, uh, late August of 2005. Uh, the uh, American soldiers said that they thought that the handheld uh, video camera that our cameraman was using to film through the windscreen uh, was a rocket-propelled grenade launcher, and they riddled the car with bullets. Uh, last summer, uh, our uh, camera uh, photographer, uh, Nimir Nur and uh, his driver were killed in a missile strike in Baghdad. Uh, and uh, shortly after that, we lost the seventh uh, colleague in Iraqi translator whose family don't want, them, don't want us to name him, who was killed with two of his brothers at a fake checkpoint. So very difficult situation and not that untypical, although the, the balance of casualties and the causes of death are and John, what's been the cost for the New York Times? And uh, broaden it out if you can, uh, among uh, others you know. I mean, Raggy Omer's piece in the, uh, in the Media Guardian, was it yesterday, talks about the danger of, for anyone, any Iraqi now, being known to associate with Western journalists, being topped essentially for if there's an association. Well, I, I think that uh, Reuters have suffered much more than we did, but I think. Our experience is probably, in some respects, more representative, at least proportionally. We lost two of our Iraqi news staff killed, uh, and we were in little doubt that in both cases they were killed by militiamen or insurgents because they were working for the New York Times. Our Basra Stringer Faha Haider in 2005, and uh, a young 23-year-old interpreter reporter in our Baghdad bureau um, Khalid Hassan about uh, a month before I left last autumn who was executed on his way um, to work. Um, we haven't fortunately to date had any casualties amongst our 
expatriate staff, which has um, something to do with luck, but also, I think, reflects the fact that much of the most dangerous work has had to be done by, um, by Iraqis, um, who are, in many respects, uh, the real heroes of this war. In fact, the figures you cite, I think it's probably the case that over 90 percent of the journalists who have been killed in Iraq have been, have been Iraqis. Okay, the reason I'm, uh, we don't need to go into areas which have been raised at News World and News Exchange and so on, but very quickly, what is your experience about five years, uh, after f your five years of experience, whether certainly the coalition militaries understand the role that you have getting good information out? Is it still as tense as it was back in 2003, 2004? No. Are the Office of the Secretary of Defense, Brian, uh, Larry Dorita and Whitman, are they still sort of on the blower saying, get these people out of that area? No, our experience in this respect, I think, is quite a lot different from Reuters, and I'm trying to think, as Ersto was speaking about there, the lost people they lost, what the difference would be. As a news agency, you have to be out there very fast, and if I'm not mistaken, most of the people you lost were with people with cameras. Yeah. Um, we, of course, had photographers as well, but we learned pretty quickly to build a delay into uh, deploying them or allowing them to deploy into places of immediate danger, uh, car bombings, suicide bombings, etc. So that gave us a cushion that others didn't have. Uh, I think our relationships with the American military were quite a lot better. Now, whether that has to do with the fact that we're an American news organization, um, but do they understand the, the principle of the media being there during operations? I, I would say that uh, we had some difficulties to begin with in terms of access in the first uh, year or year and a half of the war. But I think, you know, they've learned a lot of lessons, a lot of bitter lessons in Iraq. And by in 2005, certainly, um, we were finding we had pretty free access with the American Armed Forces, and our experiences on embeds, which is, by the way, only a new term for something that's been going on ever since Russell went to the Crimean War uh, 150 or 60 years ago, um, on embeds, our experience was that we had virtually unlimited access. Uh, we could go where virtually anywhere we wanted to. Uh, we were included in every intelligence briefing. Um, the restraints were, were rather few, and I think that uh, that's another lesson learned. That wasn't entirely true in the first year of the war when there was a much more intensive effort to try and mold the story that the media were telling. I'm raising this, Alistair, because you, you mentioned most of those who lost their lives and others who've been targeted were, quote, targeted by the Americans for whatever reason. And I want to move forward now and gel that with the issue of the way the technology in our business has changed. Um, particularly the new level of transparency. You've got mobile phone technology there. There's this area you can now access so much and transmit it so quicker, so much quicker. What impact is that having on this um, interface now with the military particularly? Mm. Do they accept that or not? I'm not so sure that in the past five years the technology in Iraq has changed that much, actually. I mean, mobile phone I haven't been there for the past year, but mobile phones are still pretty rudimentary in, in, in Iraq. Um, my sense was that there is um, the military at the top talk the right talk about journalists. Um, and there is certainly a willingness, I think, the American military in particular, and coming as a, as a non-American who's seen other armies in action, and this was my first experience of seeing the Americans in action, um, their openness to journalists is extraordinary um, when you're embedded, you know, that anybody can say anything pretty much to you. It's quite a disarming experience. Uh, but where I'm not sure that we ever really have made much progress is in getting over the idea both to the senior commanders and particularly the commanders on the ground that journalists are not all, are not all European, American, white guys who want to be embedded, who are likely to encounter the, an American soldier and he'll recognize them as somebody who might be on his TV screen. The journalists are Iraqis who live in Ramadi, or in Haditha and carry cameras and work for us and are trained by us and understand what they're about and are not involved in any kind of vi uh, violent activity. And I've been told sitting in the Pentagon that our problem with not so much just the people being killed because they were carrying cameras, but people being arrested, people being jailed, we've had people being tortured by American soldiers, 
long before anybody knew about the Abu Ghraib scandal, uh, because they were around taking pictures. Um, I've been told, sitting in the Pentagon, that we were employing too many indigenous people. Uh, too many Iraqis were doing reporting in Iraq. And if I showed up in the streets of Ramadi and pointed a camera at them, that would probably be okay. I'd get almost certainly tortured and killed by the other side, but I'd be fine <laughs> with that. And I'm not sure that that message has really got through yet. We, we've had some signs that there would be attempts in uh, training troops in the uh, exercises they go through before they get deployed into Iraq, where guys in, you know, Iraqi looking guys with cameras would pop up and take pictures, and they were supposed to not shoot them during these exercises. Uh, but I personally don't know if that's, that's been put into. Uh, All right, so a lot of work still needs to be done in campaigning on our side. John, particularly, can I go back to uh, five years ago? When you look at what you wrote and what you thought was going on, how do you think what you wrote uh, will stand up uh, against the record uh, reviewed and published by contemporary historians? When you read Tom Ricks's book or Michael Gordon's mm. book or Bob Woodward's book or Jonathan Steele's book, mm. do you say, shit, I wish I had known that at the time, and I, or I didn't know it at the time, I should have known it. In other words, how much did journalism really appreciate the dynamics of what was going on well, it, in a massively complex a area of a vast country. Well, the general answer would be it would be enormous hubris for anybody who's ever covered a story as vast and as complex as this not to admit that there were a lot of things that we should have spotted earlier and we should have investigated more than, than we did. But to, to narrow it down to my own experience as one acknowledgement that I'm quick to make whenever this question is asked, and that is, um, I don't, I would not plead guilty to being amongst those who, in the words of some of those on the left, paved the way to war in the way that we wrote about uh, Saddam's regime before the invasion. Uh, the most compelling aspect of that society for, a, for a, a journalist was the terror, the brutality, the murdering that was going on. and. I, and I wasn't alone in this, felt that as a matter of honor, I should write about this not from London or Amman, but from Baghdad, um, and earn myself the mocking sobriquet of the most dangerous man in Iraq from the information ministry for doing so, by which I meant, I, I took them to mean, you think you're brave, you wait until you don't have that suit of armor on anymore, and then we'll see how brave you are. And in fact, they eventually did come for me. But what I think we need to acknowledge is what we didn't do. I think uh, we were so transfixed by the tyranny that uh, and the human rights abuses, um, and so in the most, I think, convinced that if the Iraqi people could be relieved from this at acceptable cost, it wouldn't be such a bad thing. In other words, we were inclined to think that an invasion of Iraq might uh, be a net benefit, um, and clearly uh, that will come into question in history, that we didn't write about the kind of society that the Americans were going to uncover by lifting that carapace of terror. We didn't write sufficiently about how deeply traumatized Iraq was by 25 years nearly of Saddam's terror. We didn't write uh, uh, or explore the fissures that have run through that society for uh, 1,400 years, the fissures of ethnicity, uh, sect, tribe, uh, indeed, those things which made any prospect of the American enterprise in Iraq succeeding so improbable. So if you, why would you be asked, what would you do if you had to do it again? It would be to write a great deal more about those things. My guess is, from all we know about Bush's um, uh, Washington at the time, that it wouldn't have made a great deal of difference, that the decision had been made very early on that they were going to do this and that we probably didn't impact very seriously on the decision to go to war or not to go to war. How uncomfortable did you feel looking back at the, you know, Rick Bragg, Jason Blair, Judith Miller? Do you feel your journalism was sucked into an expectation, maybe a command from your editorial desks in New York? No. No, I, you know, I, we, could, we could tire everybody out very quickly with a discussion about what happened well, give with, me your one minute with, version. with uh, Judy Miller. I'm asking uh, about your journalism and how it affected the way you wrote and maybe you framed what no, you were writing. No, I had to say, and I would say this is 33 years as a foreign correspondent at the New York Times, um, 
there were no, le no expectations laid upon me. Whatever I did wrong um, or right, I'd have to take the discredit or credit for myself. Uh, my editors uh, were happy. I don't remember a single story being suppressed uh, in the run-up to the war um, or changed in any significant uh, degree. I was free to report as I wanted to. Um, and the Judy Miller experience, which was a miserable one from the New York Times, uh, was a kind of, in my view, a kind of sui generis uh, event, which I probably is the one subject which I'd be well to stay away from tonight because it was such a deep wound at the New York Times, and I think we've gone a long way um, to fixing the faults, the fault lines in the New York Times that made that possible. Alistair, of course, your role is slightly different uh, as an agency in terms of reporting uh, without showing any kind of um, swing one way or the other. When you look back at your reporting, whether you're in Kuwait or Qatar or then back on the desk and then also in Baghdad, how much do you, in retrospect, concern yourself that as an agency you were, you were sucked too readily into the WMD issue without questioning it? It's hard for me personally, actually, to talk too much of, to the issue of pre-war WMD. I wasn't very closely involved in that. Um, but take us through the mechanics mm. of how an enorm enormous mm. organization like yours, mm. which the world relies mm. on, along mm. with APTN and others. I think, I mean, where we, when we look back, I think we, uh, I certainly feel comfortable that we put forward our main criterion, which is to try to present the broadest range of factual stories that we can, and to try to put out, this is what these people are saying, this is what is, people are doing, we clearly have to, on any one day, as, make some kind of assessment of what the most important issues are. We devote resources to them. We'll write wrap-up stories that will you know, focus on certain issues. Um, but my sense is that uh, we have really focused on what we see as our principal job, which is getting in there and finding out what is going on. And reporting what people say, sure, but really trying to get in there over the last five years in a place where there was no, there was, we, it was really news from first principles. There was nobody there. There was nobody to pick up whose reports we could pick up. We had to get in there, form a network, build a structure of journalism in a country that had had no independent journalism. But when you compare, present people with what the when you look was. at your files from those days, you probably don't go back to them that much these days, but when you look at the file or think back to the file and you think now and you probably read the, the current very contemporary um, immediate history books, both of the US operation, the British operation and so on, do you say to yourself, we actually did well? Yeah. Or do you say, rather like uh, John did, you know, there are, there are things which I wish we had noted at the time, uh, given that we're providing 24-7 cover? I think, and I, I, I really, I'm, I, I can't talk to pre-war, but I, I would say that I can go back and point to stories that we were doing from the very, very early days of the war that were highlighting trends that would become major That's trends true. and which were heavily criticized at the time. And we had to withstand a lot of criticism in the blogosphere and from a lot of our clients in America and from the authorities, focusing on things like the killings at Fallujah in April 2003. You're talking about the private security 19, contractors. No, this no, was no, the 82nd okay. Airborne yeah, yeah. Division, which yeah. uh, killed you know, 19 people and wounded yeah. 80 Within in a crowd of 100, yeah. um, mm. and poisoned the atmosphere in Anbar province. We were there. That was the top story of the day. Um, we reported on abuses by American troops. We reported on the radicalism of the Shiites and the forming of Shiite militias. So I think, actually, if you go back, I could go back and point to stories that we had by just sticking to the basics of getting the news out on a particular day, this is what's happened in this country. Here it is. This may be significant in this way, that both the politics and the violence, uh, right back to 2008, when the bombs started going off in Baghdad, how people responded, when the political formations were forming, particularly amongst the Shiites, the radicalization of the, the Sunnis in the West, I think that's all there. Can I just say something about before it slips away since I took a kind of self-denying audience on weapons of mass destruction? There is one what do you mean by that? Well, by saying that I don't particularly want to discuss the, the Judy Miller affair, which I think would probably quickly exhaust people's patience anyway. But I will say something about 
coverage of weapons of mass destruction from Baghdad, um, which is, I think there was a failure of imagination on our part because uh, in covering, just to speak of the last chapter, the weapons inspections that recommenced in November 2002 uh, and really went nowhere until the weapons inspectors departed uh, in March, I think, late February, early March of 2003, uh, uh, upon the imminence of the war. Uh, the fact is that the Iraqis, as anybody who chased those UN weapons inspectors' convoys from 6.30 in the morning um, out of the UN headquarters, later to be bombed by Zarqawi's people, as anybody knows, the Iraqis went to extraordinary lengths to try and impede effective inspections. Uh, it was farcical. Um, the Mahabharat would chase at speeds of up to 120 miles an hour. The UN inspectors in their land cruisers are headed north, south, east, west in some futile attempt to confuse the Iraqis as to where they were going before they eventually had to, of course, adopt a dead reckoning course for a nuclear facility or a suspected biochemical facility or whatever, at which point the Mohabharat would radio ahead and you'd arrive and you'd find that there were people at the gate who would say the director general isn't here and so forth. That combined, that kind of fufara combined with 12,000 word a report that the Iraqis submitted to the United Nations on, as I recall, the 6th or 7th of December 2002, which was an absolute farrago of lies. Um, it only had to be checked against the United Nations' own reports, uh, which showed continued uh, attempts to develop uh, weapons of mass destruction at least until 1995, created in us the impression that they had something to hide and this uh, deductively that they were still involved in trying to develop things. Well, we should have, how often this has been true in my life, not just professionally as a journalist, but personally, that I followed, failed to follow through the logic of my own argument. Uh, we knew that Saddam was a, a deceiver, a manipulator par excellence. What we should have realized was that they manipulated not because they had weapons of mass destruction or were actively developing them, but because they didn't, which was a fact that he later acknowledged in debriefings to, with the CIA was that uh, he wanted Bush to believe that they had these weapons. And, and I'll say, I don't want to get into the wider controversy of this, but I think that there's been a little bit too quick a resort to condemnation on the wider issue of WMD uh, in the sense that uh, nobody who studies the record could have had any doubt that Saddam Hussein for a very long time intended to develop these weapons, nor could they have any doubt that had the French succeeded in lifting the sanctions in the summer of 2003, as they had pronounced their intention of doing, that Saddam would pretty quickly have returned to that attempt. And I cite finally only one absolutely compelling fact. There is scarcely any more honest person in this whole enterprise of the search for weapons of mass destruction than David Kelly, um, who some of us in Baghdad came to know um, in the last months of his life. And David Kelly, let's not forget, uh, for all of that, uh, he said in that interview which, uh, with the BBC, which um, cost the BBC so much later on, David Kelly believed that the Iraqis were continuing to try and develop weapons of mass destruction, and he knew more about the issue uh, than all of us put together in this room. One of the things I remember to meeting some of your colleagues, uh, John, the 24-7 website was developing at that time. There was the tyranny mm. between the New York deadline and the 24-hour yeah. deadline. And I was intrigued watching some of your colleagues coming to terms with this, the need to feed the beast. And there are several <coughs> of my colleagues here who feel that all the time. You're doing it with, uh, with, a, with, a, with a news agency. But take us through the kind of the strains and the creaking that went on when you had this, ur this urgent um, commercial imperative almost from New York. We've got to keep getting copy, mm -hmm. even though some of it won't make a lot of it won't make the final edition. Well, I don't expect much sympathy from Alistair or uh, probably the New York Times. I'm asking you about, no, no, about uh, the New York Times. Anybody, and you know, probably a number of people here who've worked for news agencies in their time, uh, who can only laugh when they see, I'm sure, uh, people like myself who've worked to a once in every 24 hours deadline for 30 years, struggling with the new world of 24 hour journalism. And it's been a big struggle. It's not an easy one to resolve. How do you? 
uh, if we can do no better at the end of the day than when Reuters has done, we might as well pack up and go home. This is not to diminish what Reuters do, which is absolutely invaluable. As, uh, you know, if you came and took a photograph of me of any night in Baghdad, you'd find Reuters copies sitting beside my keyboard as I wrote. We should be able to do, there should be some value added at the end of the day. Uh, how do we maintain that value added if at the same time we have to turn ourselves in effect into news agency reporters, especially at a time when the finances of newspaper in America are so dire to the extent that the New York Times announced only a month ago that we were going to have to lay off 10% of our editorial staff in New York. How do you, we're hoping that there's a crossover point, which is a whole other subject, but when our falling uh, revenues to the print operation are exceeded by the rapidly rising revenues to our web operation, but we don't know how far out that is. But what I'm trying to get to is the fact that there you were in a process of transition imposed upon you from yeah. New York at the same time as covering an occupation, a very dynamic story, a masses of violence, a lot going on elsewhere. Mm. There's only 24 hours in the day and you've expressed regret that certain things you didn't really dig into. In other words, the impossibility of squaring the sphere rather than just the circle. Well, I, I, I don't know if this really answers your question, but um, I, we work in an imperfect business. Um, and anybody who pretends otherwise is, frankly, is an imposter. Uh, of course, we give an inadequate representation of the reality um, every day. We try and improve uh, as we go on. Uh, but uh, my, my, the first editor I had at the New York Times, um, a great, in my view, um, a historic figure in American journalism, Abe Rosenthal, um, said to me after about the second or third story I wrote when I arrived in the Metro department in 1975, um, and it was fundamental. He said, you know something? Our job is to tell the reader what we don't know as well as what we do know. That, I have to say, was, and I'd already been a journalist for about nine or ten years at that time. I think I lived in the world of belief that we could produce something that was more or less the truth, uh, more or less a perfect representation of reality. And of course, we can't do that. And in amidst the chaos of Iraq um, and all the other things we've discussed, the problems of getting to the story, the physical risks involved, um, within a year of the start of the war, we could no longer exit Baghdad by road, except in the most exceptional circumstances, which took James Bond-like uh, logistics in order to pull off. Uh, in the face of all of these difficulties, of course, what we produced was, against the measure of history, it's going to prove to be in many ways inadequate, but I would see it from the other way around. I think on the whole that all the important trends, all of the trends which led uh, to what we see now, um, the miseries we've seen in the last five years, I think we picked up on those fairly quickly. Uh, right, that's a rich area which others may want to come back on, particularly my colleague Caroline Hawley and others who also have that experience. And I'd like to, to move you forward in the last five minutes before we have a wider discussion. When you look back uh, at your time, and obviously you weren't there tw uh, tw 12 months a year, but when you look back to critical moments as you reflect both on your journalism and the history of what took place, give me an idea of the three or four critical moments that you remember which you think were turning points one way or the other. Mm. Alistair. Mm. John, do you have one? Well, Politically, I, I mean, I think the first election, the, the, thought, the, the gelling of the uh, political movement of the Shiite alliance in the months before the first election, which took a long time, I think, for everybody to pick up on, absolutely critically. It was partly a reaction to what had gone on in the response to the disbanding of the army and the, resp the Sunni response to it. Uh, but I think the gelling of politics around the Shiite alliance and the movement coming out of Najaf and the links with Iran were absolutely a turning point for, will continue to be for years to come. What about Black Points, Fallujah, for example? Do you consider those were black times, particularly for US forces, or something which, when you look back, were critical watersheds militarily, even though it looked pretty ghastly at the time? I would say militarily, in terms of uh, the American position in Iraq, Fallujah in April 2003, uh, where it became clear that it was absolute. What was most striking was that the uh, total uh, military backing for a unit which had, as far as we could see, 
hit with bullets every one of 100 people in a square at night uh, protesting and unarmed in response to one person, according to their own version, who had a Kalashnikov. Uh, that was accepted as a, a correct response, and it completely poisoned and would go on through other incidents to poison at least that part of the Iraqi population against the American. John. Uh, the first week, the failure to control the looting, um, the first signs of a complete incompetence on the part of what became the Coalition Provisional Administration, demonstrated by the first Bureau Chief's gathering summoned by, uh, at the palace, uh, where we complained about having absolutely no press access. And they said, they said, well, I tell you what we'll do. We'll put a man outside the palace for 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening with a Thuraya satellite telephone. In the morning, we'll take questions. In the afternoon, we'll answer them. That was their, their sense of um, you know, interactive relations with ships of the press. Uh, you know, I think looking back on it, we could have concluded pretty quickly that if they went on like that, they were going to lose the war. Abu Ghraib. Um, certainly was an absolutely major turning point in terms of the impact that it had on, of course, domestic Iraqi opinion, but also on world opinion. I think the world washed its hands of the American enterprise in Iraq. Could you feel Iraq. that through the American military structure, the context you had? Oh, yes. It, they, it was recognized right at the top as being an absolute uh, disaster. I spent the last afternoon of uh, General Sanchez's time in Iraq sitting with him after he'd handed over to General Casey, and he opted out of the lunch that was given after the transfer of authority um, ceremony at Camp Victory and invited me to go and talk to him. And um, Rick Sanchez, for all his failings as military commander, uh, which have been chronicled, was a deeply honest man. And that conversation with him and his own acknowledgment of responsibility privately to me um, I, I, you could see uh, in that, and well, he wasn't the only officer I spoke to at the time, of course, that they realized what an absolute disaster it had been. He said to me, since I've raised his name, um, I offered him an opportunity, because it was a pretty gloomy afternoon for him. I think he knew he was never going to get his fourth star. He was the first Hispanic officer ever to get a third star in the United States military. Bush was behind him for political as well as you might say professional reasons. I think he knew that had gone. And as the light slipped away that day, I offered him in kind of a consoling way an opportunity to put this into some sort of context which would have relieved him of some of his own sense of responsibility for it. And he said to me, John, let me tell you something. Uh, he said, as a young lieutenant, first lieutenant, my unit, first unit commander said to me, Sanchez, he said, never forget that in any unit you command, a certain number, and Sanchez said, he said 10%, he said, I put it quite a bit higher than that, are going to be people who are potential criminals. And as you, uh, by discipline and oversight, extinguish those tendencies, uh, you'll have a disaster. And he said, that's what happened. He said, I forgot what my first unit commander told me. So I'd say Abu Ghraib would be the second turning point, and the third would be uh, much more recent. I think we were slow to recognize the fundamental change that was taking place in Anbar with what is now known as the Awakening began. Uh, I mean, we reported as being astonishing and a tremendous surprise, but I think if we'd been to one on from autumn of thousand, uh, we would have realized what a fundamental change that was. Of course, it may not last, but entirely in reason, all the Sunni insurgents switching sides. But uh, much of what we've seen in the past year, and it's been more than 60% increase in violence across Iraq, and 80% decrease uh, in bad, is down to that change. I think we were thought that. Though I could, ironically, one of the reasons was that uh, the U.S. military had made it almost impossible for journalists to operate in Anbar, and had imprisoned uh, several of my staff, uh -huh. and had others in the wanted list uh, who were reporting. And somebody who came out of Abu Ghraib prison after five months was among the first to report the rise of the awakening uh, in Ramadi. But he was doing so while there were wanted posters up for him in a U.S. post around the town. Uh, so they, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I would, you know, we were fought, we fought for a long time to report better from Anbar, and it was very, very difficult. Final, final, sorry. Yeah, uh, turning point. Clearly, uh, what happened after the Samara bombing, um, yeah. mm -hmm. the way that turned, the poison that it spread.
particularly throughout Baghdad, and we all remember sitting there at the time, seeing our staff on that very day. Uh, one of my staff took a call from a relative uh, that a, another relative, his sister-in-law, had been shot dead uh, in her house in, in Baghdad by people taking revenge on Sunnis for what had happened at Samarra. And the way that poison spread around the city was uh, astonishing. Neither of you have mentioned the capture of Saddam Hussein, the execution of Saddam Hussein, mm. or Zakawi being killed. Oh, well, of course, the Americans on each occasion looked for, hoped, predicted a change in the arc of the war um, and did, didn't come. And of course, uh, you know, this is, this is hindsight. I'm not sure I could have said this on December the 13th, 2003, yeah. mm. when Bremer shouted, as we saw, we got him. And it was quite a heady moment, particularly for somebody who lived and worked in Iraq under Saddam. Um, the expectation it would make a big difference would have been bankrupted by the realization that they weren't fighting for the rest of Iran. I mean, Fallujah, April, May 2003, you could already tell Saddam was not the issue. Um, the real issue of Sunnis was they were going to be supplied uh, after a thousand years of war uh, of, of Indian in Iraq by the Shiites. But there was very little, of course, demonstrations for Saddam. But if you, as I did, uh, it seems so now to remember it, but there was a time when you could actually walk the streets of Fallujah and talk to people before 2004. And you talked to crowds at Fallujah. Um, if you mentioned the same name of Saddam Hussein, the hour, and it was insistent and loud, depict us as people who uh, loved Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein murdered us too. Uh, he never did any good for anybody but his own life and his own family. Uh, it wasn't the restoration of Saddam, so the cat Saddam was not to make and Zikali. much difference. Well, the geopolitics of the region, mm. much beyond Iraq, Saudi, and elsewhere. Okay. I didn't notice it make okay. any difference. No, I think, you know, I think with what the Americans have learned, having chopped off, there was a, a wonderful occasion uh, when political Rick Lynch, he was then a, uh, he was the chief spokesman for the mm. command. He became much more effectively a divisional commander south of Baghdad in, during the past year where his troops were really quite effective in com combination with the way in making, turning things around in the southwest of Baghdad. Rick Lynch as spokesman, he um, come every week with a chart of the Al-Qaeda incident they had been chopped off. Uh, and it was a grand thing to see this chart and the chopped off, captured people or killed um, and the tier one, tier two, tier Al-Qaeda people. And uh, one report, I wish you could remember who it was, because Rick Lynch had quite a temp. He's a Texan, a cigar, actually Ohio born, but cigar chomping, Harley Davidson riding uh, general who seems to have modeled himself somewhat on a strange life. And not strange life. Mm. Anyway, so one of the women, the American reporters there, said, you know, considering that you've picked up on 60 leaders of Al Qaeda, how they continue to cause such mayhem. And he marched rather menacing over to where he was, actually had a cigar in his hand, which had. And he looked down at her. And he said, Madam, he said, uh, you uh, I will continue to cause my hem in this country despite all we've done to him. He said, the answer is because Abu Musab Zarqawi ain't paying attention. <laughs> he said, uh, it didn't make any difference. It, this is a, you know, this is a hydra-headed uh, monster. Right in the discussion, sir, we've hung out a lot of uh, issues and left some of them dangling. Please, yeah. Just tell us who you are if you'd like to. Oh, yeah, my name is Kevin Reese for the Art Centre. Um, I'm wondering whether the, the failing that we're talking about, because there's a sense there's some kind of failing in journalism, is actually kind of a lot, it's really kind of quite, potentially quite simple. And it's a lack of contextual analysis all the way through the process. So, for instance, why were, maybe this is systemic in journalism, maybe this is something we, we have real trouble dealing with, but why were we so fixated about the issue of WMD? for instance, that rather than asking broader geopolitical questions about why any country would want to become involved in military conflicts in the Middle East. And much more specifically than this, why when smart, I mean, I don't, want, I don't want to get seduced or kind of caught up in the idea that journalists were somehow seduced, particularly by the Bush White House. That's not the issue. The issue is, were journalists seduced by kind of smart white guys, Western guys in suits, jumping up in centers of power separate from the Middle East, and saying, hey guys, just listen to us. We understand the Middle East. We're going to be quite simple. Everybody hates them, etc. 
extent were we, were we to listen to local journalism? The process? I mean, you were failing. I'm not sure I'd share that assessment yeah. of what we've just heard. But do you, do you think that there's a point there uh, that you were drawn in uh, too readily? I just don't recognize anything you just said. Certainly not about our journalism. Um, I, I, I really can't address the point. I mean, we report what people say. Right. I mean, that's the kind of the issue, though, because if, if the, 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 the conflict is presented as an issue about WMD and stopping Saddam, etc., to what extent was the, the analytical function of journalists seduced by the idea? I'm not sure that, I mean, from what I recall of our coverage uh, and most people's coverage before the war, it was presented as a, there was a, 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 a the, this was one of the issues at stake. People were also pointing out that uh, the U.S. wanted to remake the Middle East, wanted to, you know, there were a number of war aims uh, laid out and were, ex you know, yeah. we pointed out that this was what people were saying. And we had people reporting from Baghdad saying what was going on in Baghdad, and we had people it's reporting from every other. Sorry, I don't, city yeah, I don't think I picked up on the, the point really I want to make. In the sense of kind of local knowledge, tapping into Iraqi sense of where things were, regional Middle Eastern perspectives, how much did that inform our journalism, or well, how much was our journalism all informed of our by Western? Middle East are you know local people from the Middle East. Uh, Samia here was our uh, bureau chief in Baghdad in the run up to the war and during the invasion. And, um, we also had Iraqis working for us in Iraq. You know. John, do you recognize that? I think, first of all, the question would be better put to people who are reporters who were working in Washington and London uh, at the time. Um, certainly, I was not influenced in any respect by the debate that was going on in Washington about WMD or anything else. Uh, I just wanted to report what, I could, what was accessible to me on the ground in Iraq. And since you talk about you know, the context of Iraqi opinion, what I can say is this, that it wasn't easy to opinion, I was saying, um, uh, Pache, CNN, uh, some would do that, were ordered on the ludicrous. Uh, B Bush makes January the 20th, 2003, State of the Union, as, in which he describes as a murdering discovered. Bush, late on in the game, WM, unprovable uh, assertion. There was always a much available argument, which way was one I think it have carried quite a lot of weight, should have kept weight with uh, people who have otherwise been very keen to condemn, and which was the human rights uh, argument. The same people, we could discuss this in another context, but the same people very often who've been first condemned for Iraq. Uh, I roll in the course of the Bosnian War, uh, when Martin Bell and I were um, cohorts in, in Sarajevo, how loud were the protests of the same people about the failure of Britain, the United States, and the Western powers to intervene in Rwanda? Uh, in any case, as accessing Iraqi opinion was difficult. CNN went out after the January the 20th uh, Union, State of the Union address with a camera and said to a crowd of 100 Iraqis, OK, you have Bush condemning your president with Bush or Saddam. And they all said, blood and soul for the Saddam. And they put this out on the news with 10 minutes. Iraqi people, of course. Uh, all the publicly expressed opinion in Iraq then was intimidation led. If you took the trouble, which is for a print journalist to do than a uh, broadcast uh, journalist, those few moments, which everybody knows as a report curve, when you're in an elevator alone in a hotel, when you're in the backwash of a jet engine in an airfield, uh, where you get what seems to be like a true expression of opinion. That expression of opinion was, this included senior members of the officials of the regime, was without exception, in my experience, in favor of the Americans knocking off Saddam Hussein. There was a broad support within Iraq for getting rid of Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. A very senior official of the regime took me into the uh, parking lot of the foreign ministry um, and uh, in the rain, not long before the war, said to me, I would get a message for President Bush, the Iraqi people have attempted to kill Saddam and they failed. And the only solution, bomb, bomb. Firstly, I went for my notebook, and he actually stayed my hand. Uh, the, 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 the hatred of Saddam Hussein, the yearning for a new beginning, was very, very widespread. So I would say our reporting was, in that sense, contextualized by what we were experiencing. But let, let me just pick up on that. How do you calibrate and compare, for example, particularly in the earlier months, uh, and there are others here who might want to answer this, what you were being told, say by the American military, about what had taken place and the growing capacity of uh, the Iraqi uh, system of administration, however you want to define that, how accurate uh, what we're being told? You were then to uh, when you went to Iraqis went out and checked the facts. 
I mean, all of us were burned by the Jessica Lynch. Mm -hmm. For those of you who remember, this private first class who um, turned the wrong direction, where was it, Nasseria um, Hospital, and uh, John Kampfner did the documentary which showed that she, the doctors were actually told by the Americans to take her back to the hospital so that she could be rescued by a special forces operation at 3 o'clock in the morning. And many of us in the Ritz Cotton Hotel in Doha were all got out of bed to be told that first class Jessica Lynch had just been rescued, which is absurd. But then you got a real backlash. Were you there at the time? Uh, in Doha, weren't you? But, yeah, yes. Yeah, there was a backlash. Who was it? Michael, what's his name, from the New York magazine, who said, it's our purpose sitting here in this um, uh, uh, press center. Yeah. yeah. What's the point? And at that point, we, our, our belief in the credit of the mili military machine really collapsed very quickly mm -hmm. because the whole thing had become politicized. It end through many months. The substance. Alistair. I think we did become, and that's certainly something that we saw very quickly, uh, was our need to challenge what the military were telling us once the war started. Uh, and we were on the ground and we were challenging it. And one, something that in, in some of the, uh, the food on the, on the web uh, was, for example, the, the issue of precision bombing. And uh, the, uh, the was put on, on the precision bombing of Baghdad when we were seeing civilians being uh, shot to pieces in the marketplace. I think, I think that that questioning, when we had... Yeah, the, the Denial, and, and, and I think very, very quick, yeah. we all, you know, once the violence started, certainly the gap in the, in the military's credibility, and no more no, than the day uh, American troops entered Baghdad, and they... Can we they just get that phone down here? Because um, pick up on that. It's one of the things that I remember, certainly sitting in London, the, the wedding disaster, when I think 43 people were killed, a lot of, a lot of kids, uh, there was a gypsy band. And I remember there was a quote from, I think, Mark Kimmett, the brigadier at the time, a few days later, saying mm -hmm. this was a fuck-up. But that certainly wasn't their view. Before, uh, yeah, when, yeah, when it happened, they, they, kept on saying, they kept on saying it's a military target and they were Al-Qaeda and so on. And then we had the footage somebody filmed from the wedding. It was a party. We saw the children. We saw the wedding and this, you know, coming to them. It was a and, and then bombing. So it was one incident where you the credibility of the American army, you know, mm. you face. The same was at the Palestine hotel, hotel when they hit us. They said first it was a still fire. You know, somebody, uh, you know, attacked troops from the hotel. And actually the lobby of the hotel is, is facing the other side. And then the rocket propelled grenade at the advance, you know, really, you could attack the rocket propelled grenade uh, the tank. And they gave her admitted that they had a, a host, so... Okay, this is yeah. going to follow, particularly because of Terry Lloyd and other incidents like that, including Mazandana. I mean, the, the footage of him being shot is really quite chilling because he was actually meant to be there outside Abu Ghraib with the agreement of the Americans. But what I'm trying to get to is uh, whether you can now, in retrospect, begin to calibrate and audit how much of what you were quote and how much that is reflecting your own stand reporting and other sources you were able to get to. Because I see how I won't gouge you. <laughs> There's one or two. Uh, <coughs> but you might want to come in on this because of the pressure from people like us on the 24-hour channel uh, to get the information out on the wire. Ticking. Mm. I mean, I think we. one of the striking things that, that of my experience over the past five years is how skeptical we had to be from very, very early on, and I think how skeptical we were of what we were being told, uh, particularly by military officials, but by pretty much every, all other officials, that we could see that they were lying to us, and they were lying to us about things that were happening very directly to our ends. Uh, and well, we didn't be you know, take their word anything else they said, and I think that has did the center of gravity shift quite significantly um, over the <coughs> weeks and months. Then I think it, from my involvement started really with the invasion, and I think from that point on, during the invasion itself, we saw the distortions that were coming out from the official spokesman. And I point on that's an involvement you know started at that point. Uh, we were extremely <coughs> skeptical of everything that we were told. John, uh, probably not quite as harsh as. Alistair, but there was certainly a mood of, I suppose, most kindly put, illusionism uh, prevailing in the in the uh, uh, West for me by um, not much of Dan Sinor, the um, principal civilian American last year of the war, who invited me to dinner on his last night in Baghdad in the Rashid Hotel, that gloomy restaurant on the floor, and said, "You've been asking some very difficult questions." Um, why is that? It's quite upsetting. Um, and, and I started to describe some of what life was outside in what they called the Red Zone. Um, and he was... Dancer not practically not experienced the Red Zone at all. He was genuinely astonished. Uh, and had apparently hesitated or not paused throughout the year to sit and talk to people who were actually experiencing what Iraq was really all about. To extent that will force. Um, 
attempts at a thing that is so easy for all of us in the stress, which is believe, want to believe, no, but it, it wasn't until I would say 2005, uh, I think I wrote this at the time, that Bush made a speech about Iraq, which was visibly about the same Iraq that I was living. Up until that time, there seemed to complete, uh, complete between the reality and the illusion that was Christian about that reality. Uh, which you will tell to what extent the military Iraq were responsible for that. Were they themselves partners of an illusion? Um, hard to say. There were some very ones like okay. Batiste who resigned. There were others who didn't resign. Gone on to their fourth star. Mm. The microphone. Can you just get the microphone back? Do we have one? One, 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 one. Go ahead. No. Yeah, there is a difference here between saying that they were under, you know, there is the illusions side, but don't you recognize that the American military lied in, in uh, targets that they, they, they attacked? They said they, they were military and they were civilians. This is different from an illusion. They, they did lie. They did give us, when they attack people on a wedding and they say it's, you know, it's a military target, don't you think that this is? Yeah, I think, I think uh, I was doing a blog for my paper today and talked about some of these instances. Another one would be Haditha. There's no doubt if the sea pickup that they met, what happened in Haditha, or no relationship, what actually happened there. Um, but that was a bit of a concern up in the after action in the, reports in the, through the military uh, system. But uh, this was something that went, you know, quite, I mean, we, I mean, one of the things that I think actually helped us be pretty skeptical, and apart from what happened at the Palestine Hotel, where we had about seven different versions of how our colleagues were killed and wounded, uh, all of which would appear to be fairly deliberate to cover it up. In one case, actually had one of our correspondents being attacked physically by a military spokesman uh, to uh, an area for long before Abu Ghraib uh, was exposed when we made a complaint about the treatment of some of our colleagues who were arrested by them, tortured and subjected to kind of humiliating practices of the kind that then became familiar several months later. General San himself and other people were, went on attack against us, refused to believe, lied to us, and if the San spokesman physically again when he, they ran out of arguments, attacked my predecessor and told him that basically if he didn't shut about it, he would. So that kind of relationship, let's say a fairly robust relationship, certainly contributed to making us extra robust in the way we subjected yeah, that's those reports to. Good dynamic. How many people want to come in? Because we've got about 10, 15 minutes. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, Caroline, I, I, do, you want to, do you want to say anything or not? Because I don't... Um. Obviously, we have in front, uh, the front row, Martin, who developed the phrase tyranny of the dish uh, and you suffered from it for I what, three years in Baghdad from, it for from the BBC. Three years. That's right. Um, I mean on the point you're talking about about lies and misinformation I think the problem came when we were not able to go out because either we didn't have the time or but mainly it was too dangerous to go out and see things for ourselves so then you knew you couldn't really trust the American military it was it became very difficult to trust the Iraqi government and the truth was as well that even some Iraqi eyewitnesses you had to be careful of because I remember very clearly being told that um, a suicide bomb had been the result of uh, rockets fired from American helicopters. And people would swear blind that that had happened and they had witnessed it themselves. So the problem was we were not able in, by mid-2004 to go out and see things for ourselves. And so then you had to navigate your way through this maze of misinformation, and that was really difficult. You'd call it misinformation, would you? I think or there was were, inadequate I, no, information. No, I think there was, in some cases, there was certainly misinformation. Um, Alistair may remember, because it was a, a, someone from Roy who found American militants a police after a boat, allegedly from an Iraqi, an Iraqi who didn't want to give his name, saying, I will not be deterred by this attack, and I can't remember the exact, but I will not be deterred by this attack on, on me, on my freedom, on my country, I will, I will back. And the same quote came in another press release after another bomb. So it had clearly been made up. So there's definitely a problem mm. information. I think okay. one of the things we were able to do is, I mean, it, we talked earlier about ex trying to explain to people what we didn't know. And I think we did all, tr it was very important and continuously important to explain what we can't know. And also to try and pick out where the holes are in some of these statements. That is that a, an important methodological lesson so from, from It Iraq. was not clear how X, you know, could happen or why it would happen uh, without late, you know, late, uh, leadening our stories with you know, caveats. We have to make clear what the limits of our knowledge are and also challenge are some of these statements that come out regularly in places that we can't check. Um, people get killed. They were killed. They were placing a roadside bomb. We saw them placing a roadside bomb. They went into a house. We blew up the house. 
We later discovered the locals say, you know, women and children are killed in the house. You asked them, why roadside bomb? Did he get up and remove it? Roadside bomb. The roadside bomb that these guys were planting with you blew up the house. Oh, the military spoke they didn't know whether they'd have found a roadside bomb. The reason for blowing up the house in which the We need to keep pressing. Microphone, please. Come, come forward first. If I'm, oh, oh, please. John and Alistair, why don't you just jump in if you feel there's something you want to comment on, and I'll get as many quotes as possible. Um, my question is... Could you identify yourself? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, my name's Nick Norman Butler. I'm a freelance. Um, my question was a story that's come out recently about um, young children supposedly being trained by Al-Qaeda. Um, and use, and the, the videos that came out, I'm sure many people saw them of them in football shirts and balaclavas and uh, supposedly kidnapping people. Many people I've spoken to, in fact, almost exclusively say that they think this story is bullshit and it's been planted. Um, I must say I did coverage of that, um, so I'd be interested to know whether you support that, and if so, which is the confound, why? Uh, the, supposedly the CIA who planted this, their, their techniques have become unsophisticated, journalists' methods have become more sophisticated and spotted the fake, or um, perhaps you think it's genuine, I don't know, but, and, and then finally, is this the sort of thing you uh, encounter more often now or less? John? I don't know, uh, about, I wasn't but there. the principle. So, uh, you know, I want to say something that's probably not going to be very popular here. I think that we need to put, we're talking about contextual reporting. I think that in assessing all of this, we have to look at the history of warfare and ask ourselves how, for example, in the Second World War, um, how honest were our armies as they drove on Germany on what was going on? I can tell you they weren't very honest. I have a brother-in-law who um, exited the battlefield of D-Day with one of the highest honors that this nation can give and who told me about the sorts of things that happened when he turned to the battle and the crossing of the Rhine. And they involved uh, the raping and murdering of uh, German families by uh, British units, none of which was ever reported. Um, I think that for an army to fight war is to a as this, be completely honest, it's not an easy thing to do. This doesn't accuse lies. Uh, but when you weigh all of this against the need, battlefield commanders have to maintain morale, uh, the pressures that there are from their superior officers. Uh, to say the Americans have learned a lot of lessons in Iraq, and their accounting for this war is a great more on now than it was at the beginning. But I do think we need to set this into some kind of a context, and to achieve perfect honesty at war, it seems to me, is probably beyond accomplishment. Do you think this is an important development uh, in the development of, um, of military and security reporting, though? The fact, and you've just used a very important phrase, it's, I think I'm quoting you roughly right, forcing greater accountability. Mm. In other words, have you, are you, in the kind of journalism that you and all your colleagues have been doing, particularly in, in Iraq and to a certain extent in Afghanistan now, forcing form of dog within the military. We're going to do this, we've got to do it, however dirty it is, and be prepared to account for it. Yes. And is this now an important development of the last four years? Yeah, I, think that's, I think that is a lesson that has been, has been hoisted in. And, and Alistair will, I'm sure, agree with this, as will Caroline, um, that whilst there were villains in the American military command, who was untrue that lies times, to give the impression that there was an entire army bent on deceiving um, is, is a huge disservice. There were, uh, and you met them on every embed you went, officers, men, uh, who were uh, deeply committed to conveying the truth of this war, uh, even at great risk to themselves. Have a painful and costly been. Yeah, I'll give, me, give you just one example. Quickly, General, if you can, John. General Peter yeah. Corelli, who mm. could be, even now, the next commander in Iraq. He could be General Petraeus' his successor. Pete Corelli was the hearts and minds general of this war. And when he came back for his second rotation as corps commander, that's the number two American officer in Iraq, he was the one who forced through a proper investigation of what happened in Haditha. He was the one by uh, introducing new what they call escalation of force rules, which required any use of American firepower, which involved um, wounding Iraqis, wounding or killing Iraqis, had to be reported immediately up the chain of command. Uh, he brought about a whole change of culture, which was very unpopular. It was even unpopular with George Casey, who was the top commander in Iraq at the time. So there are American officers at a very high level who have understood 
the need for much greater candid and honesty. In a timely way. Yeah. Okay. Anything to add, Alistair? Um, I think it was a, an important part of our job to get over uh, what the effect of the American presence uh, was. And I think that there were so many blunders with the concealing and the manipulation of information that uh, this was something that people needed to know. It was backfiring. We had people arrested on trumped up charges, not even just, that was dramatic of the arrests of hundreds and thousands of other people. Failures of intelligence, a failed policy that was having an effect on the way that the American operation was seen. And it was important to, to keep reporting that. I think there, you know, there are elements in, clearly in which uh, they, were, uh, they were trying to improve things. But OK, please. Hello, it's Catherine Philp from The Times. Um, I just wanted to ask you, John, particularly as you've you know, recently left and you're, you're one of the very few correspondents who was there at the beginning who, who was still there at the time that you left. The, there's a handful now of people who've remained in Baghdad. Um, a, a lot of pe people like myself and Caroline have got tired and moved on. Um, and and it, it, it was a difficult war for the media because we had uh, criticism from the beginning about being negative. We had criticism for daring to embed, you know, how dare we uh, go along with the military, do these things. It, it sometimes felt like, like journalists could do no right. Um, as as uh, Andrew said at the very beginning of that in the film, it was also, it's also the most dangerous uh, war for journalists in history. I just wonder um, if you, what, what you think the Iraq war will mean for, for the media in the long term, whether there's some specific legacy that this war will have um, when we look back. And I should ask you, have you been in Afghanistan as well, John? Yeah. yeah. I mean, can you see lessons learned uh, in Iraq, or even if it's bad experience, being picked up, certainly by the NATO forces in Afghanistan? Well, I would say one of the things we've learned is, um, to, uh, on the positive side, that uh, we can report pretty effectively even in the most dire circumstances. Uh, the Lebanese civil war, as you know, uh, was undercovered if not, if not, if, if, if not uh, completely forgotten about after the uh, kidnapping of the journalists uh, early on in that war because American Western media withdrew, many of them, including the New York Times. We couldn't withdraw from this war and we had to adapt uh, to make it possible to go on reporting. And I would say that that's something, and I speak here, if I say credit, credit to uh, the people who employ us, who in the case of the New York, we weren't all true, so Nick told me what the BBC um, has been spending on its operation in Baghdad. Uh, the New York Times... Off the record. Yeah, you notice I didn't mention it, but I can mention the New York Times figure. The New York Times figure for local costs in Baghdad, uh, three years ago, passed three million dollars. My wife, who is still in Baghdad, runs our budget, so I know what it is now, and because our publisher and our editor have not revealed it. I can tell you it's substantially higher than that. And those are just local costs before we factor in all the uh, half million dollar armored cars and uh, the fact that we give people such generous outs. You work six or eight weeks in, you get four or six weeks out, etc. This is an extremely expensive war to cover, the most expensive. But by spending that money, they've made it possible for us to cover this war. And I would say that when all is said and done, and people look back, what, they will, what a fair judgment would be for all of the imperfections, for all of the things that we were late to spot, that the principal trend lines of this war were picked up on by the Western press pretty soon, and that there aren't going to be any great surprises, I would guess. I think the fact that, you know, if you, I, one, one thing that astonishes me, one would expect an audience like this to be pretty well informed. They know who General Sanchez was. They know who Abu Musab Zakawi was. But what astonishes me when I ride an airplane or a train and talk about Iraq is how well informed ordinary people are, the ordinary punter. And how has he come to be so well informed in this country? I would say very largely through the BBC, your newspaper. I don't think we've done that bad a job. OK. John Sutcliffe, BBC. Yeah, uh, John, John Sutcliffe, BBC. Can I just ask for a brief uh, regional context? I'm thinking in particular of Iran, the role it's playing inside Iraq and the regional influence it is now uh, harboring. 
Uh, I think so, some of that has become a lot clearer since uh, in the year or so since I left. But um, I think, uh, as in all these contexts, um, there is a there is a role clearly being played by by Iran. But at the same time, you can't uh, underestimate the sense of uh, nationalism and uh, Arab. Uh, identity amongst the, uh, the, the the ruling Shiite group in, in Iraq. And uh, uh, I think uh, it would be foolish to see uh, the people who have the ambition to, uh, to rule Iraq for a, a good long time, uh, that their ambition is simply to be puppets of Tehran. Okay. John, what did you think when Ahmadinejad jumped on a plane, flew into Baghdad, and drove in from the airport? Well, we've seen many astonishing things, and that was just one of the more uh, recent examples, but I, I agree absolutely with uh, what Alistair has said, that uh, let's not forget, although they were compelled, about two-thirds of the army that fought for Iraq in the eight years of the Iran-Iraq war were Shiites. Um, and if you spoke to them, uh, there weren't too many of them who had any doubt uh, that what they were doing, as they saw it, was defending the country there. The vast majority of Iraqi Shiites are Arabs. Um, and I think that nationalism is uh, a more powerful factor in the reckoning of all of this uh, than is sect or faith. Anyone else want to jump in? Uh, no more hands going up. Oh, yes, please. Uh, Joyce, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Could you just introduce yourself one more, and then I think probably that's it. Uh, Joyce Barnathan, International Center for Journalists. Uh, I have to ask the 2008 election question. How do you, do you feel any of the U.S. candidates are getting it right and, or is anyone getting it, is anyone sharper than the other in terms of understanding what's on the ground and proposing policies that might be better? John? Woo. What are your readers saying? I tell you one What are your readers writing? One thing that a foreign correspondent in the New York Times is well advised to do is to stay out of American uh, politics, which is extremely hard to do. I had a... I was invited to go down to the White House and talk to President Bush uh, about a year ago and on the train down to Washington because it was only made clear to me at midnight uh, the night before that I wasn't going to see Hadley, the National Security Advisor, as I thought. And the Secret Service called me and said, your appointment with the President's been moved up by 15 minutes. So I found myself uh, sitting, talking in the White House to Bush and I had called my editor uh, from the train to say, uh, you know, this is based on, in part, on a personal relationship that goes back 30 or more years, mostly with his father. Um, and uh, I've been in the US, so I wasn't going to say no. Um, and he said to me, I'm going to stay out of the politics of the war. So when I sat down, I said to Bush, um, you know, I'm happy to hear, uh, but I can't, I don't want to get drawn into anything that involves the politics of this war. And I realized five minutes into it that that was complete bull. <laughs> Everything's war is politics. So I said to him, uh, how na naive can be? Although that's what I'm going to throw to side, I'll have a candid discussion with you about this war, but I want your assurance that this conversation stays in this research. Oh, I turned to Bartlett and to Hadley and to others who were there and say, that's OK, guys, right? And I said, I don't want you turning around to Harry Reid or somebody like that and saying I had the New York Times bureau chief in my Oval Office the other day, and he said this or, or that. Well, that's fine. Well, of course, it's all recorded. Um, so tell us what happened, John. Tell, tell us what, what happened in the, in the discussion, just picking up Joyce's point about where, where oh. he thinks, even though he's out of office, Oh, OK. Go. Well, I mean, it, it, it was an off-the-record discussion. So I'd ask you, and there's no reason why anybody here would... Well, you're on the record here, of course. <laughs> Don't forget, you're, no, among, you're among no, friends. It's a conversation. But there's no, there, there are no surprises. He, his concern then, we're talking about a year ago, was that their progress was surged, that they, my phrase, not his, they boxed in Hillary Clinton, who was assumed was going to be the Democratic nominee, possible for her to advocate a precipitate uh, withdrawal. Now, to go more directly to your question, I just observed from a, from a great distance that somebody whose campaign appeared to be at a dead end only six months ago, nine months ago, so uh, John McCain has become the runaway uh, leader, uh, the cert of the Republican nomination, and that's presumably because Iraq has moved down in the scale of issues, probably even further down as a result of the meltdown on Wall Street than it was before as a result of the success of the surge. Maybe I'm getting this wrong, but who would have guessed a year ago that somebody who uh, has advocated, been an advocate of this war from the beginning, uh, could be nominated by that party uh, to run for the presidency? But just to what? But of course, he's been there for the last two days. 
in he has, Iraq. And I have to say, you know, today, I think give John McCain some credit. He has a son who's a Marine in Anbar. And the uh, command had issued a statement this morning about his visit to Haditha. He walked the streets of Haditha yesterday. He's very careful not to take press with him, uh, not to make statements, uh, and to make no mention of the fact uh, he thanked the Marines in Haditha. I don't know where his son is serving in Anbar. But he's made absolutely no mention of this. I can think of quite a few American politicians, not to be invidious and mention any names, but including at least one who's running for the nomination on the other side, who in the same circumstances might have been a lot less discreet. And I think that goes to the question, frankly, of character. I asked him when he was in Iraq, uh, probably the eighth or seventh, eighth, eighth time he was there, I had breakfast with him, again, a little over a year ago. And I said, don't you think that your support of the surge could cost you whatever chance you have of the presidency? And he, sa he said it again on, on the campaign trail. He said, well, I'd rather lose an election than, than lose a war. And I actually I think John McCain should be given um, credit for that. If I can tell one other story about meeting Bush, which I don't mind telling, I was very interested to know who had given the overrule on uh, the hanging of Saddam. We knew we'd written about the fact that Saddam went to bed on the night of the 29th, as I recall, December 2006, the assurance because the Eid holiday was about to begin. And we, legal priorities have not been fulfilled. His American captors had said, go to bed, sleep well, it's not going to happen now. And they had woken at five past three in the morning to say, so there's been an overrule. George Casey had issued an order from his vacation retreat at a spa in Phoenix that he not be re released. So I was very interested to know where did the override come? I didn't believe that it had come from Connolly Rice. So we chatted about war and then I said to him, I want to pin it down. I can't imagine that the override can have come for anybody but you. And he said, first of all, he said to uh, Bartlett, and I knew at this point we were in the world of illusion, he said, where were we that, that, that time? Well, of course, he spends every Christmas New Year period at Crawford. So he knew where he was, and anybody who read a newspaper at that time knew that Condoleezza Rice was there because he was lined up with his team in the photographs, the AP photographs, or the latest photographs. Where were we? Was Connie there? And uh, going through this foo then he says, I want to show you something, and he leads me through the Oval Office down a little narrow corridor, you might call for reasons that you'll all be familiar with, the Clinton Corridor, uh, into what they call the room. It's a small little uh, lounge with blue furniture in it. And around the furniture, and there's a little glass case on the wall with a pistol, a silver pistol. And he said, you know what that is? That's the Padam handled him out of the hole. And uh, he said, the special officer who was standing over there with a grenade in his hand, he came here to see and gave me the pistol. Unfortunately, it's not my pistol. It belongs to the government. I have to leave it when I go. And, and I said to him, you know, when I was in China as a convert 30 ago, uh, whenever you asked a difficult question, the chairman of the Revolutionary Committee would reach for the unopened packet of cigarettes, take off the cellophane wrapper, waste a lot of time, offer of the cigarettes around, and then he would say, this is a very interesting question. And I said, you've just picked the cellophane, the cell taken the cellophane wrapper off cigarettes and did not answer the question. He bullshitted me. I know, words to that effect. He said, well, yeah, it's a really interesting question. He said, tell you what, he said, uh, why don't you come down to Crawford? He said, on short time, so yeah, we can discuss this. And I said, you're still impression at which in walked Cheney, who's going to have lunch with him. And the temperature went down about 45 degrees <laughs> instantly. And Bush said, this guy, uh, he says, OK, Dick, he, the New York Times, OK. He's an old <laughs> friend of mine. Cheney could not have been more unfriendly. Bush said, well, you sit down. We're having an interesting discussion here. And Cheney sat on the sofa, wringing his hands in fury that a New York Times correspondent should be in there. I should tell you, Bush hasn't given us an interview, a formal interview, in five years. Uh, so make of all of that what you will. What was the answer? No, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. What I left it. I said to him, I'm going to hold right. you to that. I'm going to come to court. You're going to tell me. The right. truth of the matter is it had to be him who gave the overall. John Alistair and others will have uh, plenty of other stories to tell if you catch them. I think we better round up now. It's 10 past. We've been going for an hour and a half, Marina. But thank you, John and Alistair, very much indeed. Thank you.